I'm going to read. I'm going to read from First Peter chapter three, and, and, and as I prepare to do it, uh, I want to share that this is our theme verse from Senior High Camp this past week. And this morning, uh, this is not the sermon I intended. I hadn't seen the news, I hadn't seen the TV in about four days, and I didn't know what all this chaos is going on all over the whole world. But here in our greatest country on the planet deal, we've got it out of control, wackos too. And, and I want to share this, this message that, that I think God has given me uh, to share today. It's First Peter chapter 3, starting at verse 14. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it without gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame, for it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that He might bring us to God. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Always be ready to give an answer, I think is what the NIV says. An answer for the hope that is within you. Our preparation is right here. This book, I said it with our, our children, that if we're going to be prepared to stand up for the gospel, we've got to know what the gospel says. If we're going to live as people of Jesus Christ in the world, we've got to know what's expected of us. I have heard in the last four days more opinions about things that come from good, godly Christian people. But they're, they're unbiblical. They're, they're not the behavior that Jesus laid out for His disciples. They may make us feel better. They may make sense in the world. But they're not biblical. And we can't continue to live unbiblical lives if we're going to be people of Jesus Christ. Let me make my point. Last fall, we gave a, a quiz in our Wednesday night Bible study. It was an entry-level Bible quiz uh, for, for high school seniors. It was on uh, uh, it was during our first Peter study. Do you all remember that that quiz? Does anybody remember what you got? There were twenty questions, and I think on average it was well, we scored like minus eight out of twenty or something like that. We didn't do very good, and I thought, well, maybe it's just they were worded wrong. So so I I set the the the, the quiz out at at camp. And, and on the registration table. And, and as you came through, you got your room, you got your head check, you got your papers turned in, you paid your money, then you took the quiz. And I have the results of that quiz. I graded every one of them. I ended up using one brand new marker and part of another marker to grade them. 64 quizzes for, uh, for, from high school and college age, churched, primarily Christian students. Of the 64 quizzes taken, 54 failed. Now there's some adult staff that weighed in on that. Forty-four out of the sixty-four were minus fourteen or worse. There was one person who tied with a rotten pumpkin and did not get one question right. And they tried because they had scratched out answers and answered different ones. They tried. <laughs> There were oh two people two people got minus nine, I think no. Minus minus seven. Minus seven was a D. Uh, our average score as a camp was thirty seven percentile. 
These are some of the best and brightest students that the church has. High school and college and a lot of young adult leaders who took the quiz. And our average score is 37.2. I don't know if that alarms you or not or maybe it amuses you or something, but but if if our church kids don't know the Bible any better than that, then we as the church are, are screwing up really bad. We're not getting something done right. But it's not only just the church's fault, it's got to be in our homes as well. In our homes, we aren't teaching the book. And as a result, we're not prepared to be faithful to this this declaration Peter makes over our lives to always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that is in us. We can't do it. Because this is where the preparation comes from. Second Timothy chapter 3 it is not a new word. It's, it's Scripture that we're familiar with. We've heard all of our lives that, that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God or the woman of God or the child of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. We are incompetent apart from this book as followers of Jesus. As you read on down to 2 Timothy chapter 4, I charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus who is to judge the living and the dead. By His appearing and His kingdom, preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Again, be prepared. But catch this last part. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and they will turn away from listening to the truth, and they will wander off into myths. But as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry." Without God's Word to anchor us in reality and in truth, we will quickly find ourselves going astray with whatever our culture throws out there as truth. Why is this a big deal? Uh, after reading the results of this, after putting all these Scriptures together, and after spending a great week at camp with, with some really great kids, I decided this is a big deal because what, what all the church growth experts and what all the, the statisticians tell us is that 85%, there's an 85% chance that if a person doesn't know Jesus by the time they're 15, they likely never will. How can we lead people to a God that we ourselves barely know? So I turn on the news this morning and I see I see in our country a bunch of people who because of skin color are violently protesting on either side of, of, of the... And I just want to be clear, for, for the child of God, all this racist hatred stuff that these white supremacist groups are spewing out is, is wrong, and it's evil, and we the church better stand up against it. And yet I've heard lots of Christians all weekend defending this behavior and saying it's okay. It's not okay ever for that. And maybe, maybe it's because they, they were teenagers who scored a, a minus 18 out of 20 on a Bible quiz and they just don't know any better. But we've got to make sure that we, the people of God, aren't lumped in with that. It is time to pull up our socks and our boots and dig into the Word of God. Because without the Word of God living and active in us, we're going to be just like them. Just like them. 
I just want to throw a fit today for what I've seen on TV, what I've seen, and then I think, but, but we're, we're not much better if we're trying to justify it. God's Word is living and active, Hebrews tells us. It, it's what cuts out the, the detestable things from within us and makes room for the things of God, for righteousness and holiness in us. In fact, God's Word ushers in that righteousness and holiness in us. And it matters because Scripture tells us without righteousness and holiness, none shall see the Lord. I've got to ask the question, where do you stand in response to God's Word? Or where do you stand in light of God's Word or in relation to God's Word? Because if we're... And I made the case this week at camp and it drives me absolutely batty. We're always asking God, God, show me something. God, teach me something. God, give me a message. Give me a sign. Reveal Yourself. And God picks up the book He waves it in our face and says, I I have. And you've chosen not to live by it. You've chosen not to acknowledge it. You've chosen not to bring it into your hearts or into your homes or into your church or into your schools or into your communities. What we're seeing all over the world right now is 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 a glimpse of what is coming. If the church doesn't stand up and stand on this book... I mean, I I preached for Holton and Taylor yesterday that that the wise man built his house upon the rock because the storms of life are coming and and they will bring torrential rainfall and the streams will rise and they will blow and beat against your house. But if you're established on the foundation of the rock of Jesus Christ, your house will stand. But the foolish man built his house on the sand, and when the storms came and the winds blew and and the big bad wolf showed up and huffed and puffed, all of that, the house fell and great was its destruction because there was no foundation. We, the people of God, have got to remember where our foundation is, what it is, and rebuild our lives upon it. And then we've got to convince others to do the same thing. I, 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 I laughed when I first started grading these because I thought, this kid, this has got to be the dumbest kid in the world. Who was the first person alive? Well, it was Adam, and they put Peter. And I, I laughed because I thought, how, how unintelligent can you be? By the time I graded the last quiz... Honest to goodness. And it may have been because I was exhausted already or or what, and a little extra emotional, but I wept on my desk in cabin 8 or whatever cabin it was because of uh, of these scores and what we the church have allowed young people to become. It's time that God's Word resumes its place of prominence in our lives. If we're not building on this, our destruction will be complete Our destruction will be great. Our destruction will be our end. If you're not building on this, what are you building on? And if you're a child of God and and your opinion is different than what you read here, change your opinion. We don't get to change this. This was already breathed out by God. We either accept it or reject it. But you can't walk in both sides of the the park. Change our opinions to match the book. And I think we'll see a, a, a revival begin in our communities that might even have the ability to carry over into the rest of our country. But I guarantee without it, we are doomed to where we sit. People of God, we have to have the foundation of Christ, the living Word of God, or we've got nothing. End of rant. I just want better for our kids. I just want better for my grandkids, if I ever get those. I just want, I want better for the church. 
because I've seen so much ugly, vitriolic hate. I think that's a word. And it's being put out by by people of God. It's not the way the book was written. We can't live like that. What gives, what gives the gospel message its appeal? And we're going to dig into this farther as we talk about working on our witness. Peter goes on to write, what gives the gospel its appeal is the way that Christians live this biblical life before the eyes of an unbelieving world and do it in such a way as it makes a difference in those who are looking on. If we just go with the flow, the Gospel loses its appeal through us. And nobody wants what we have. Anyhow, sorry to bring the bearer of bad news. But, but you all need to know this. I wish I had, could figure out how to make a pie chart or a graph or something. This is the best I can do. But this is the number that matters right here. 54 out of 64 fail. And I know at least 15 adult staff took this quiz. So even five of them failed. The Word of God, the breath of God, useful for teaching and training and correcting for righteousness. Without it, We've got nothing. God, today, heal heal our broken land. God, for, for me, for me when my mouth is about to speak a word that is contradictory to what you have declared, shut it. For, for your body that, that uh, is about to take action or to do things that, that are contrary to what you've laid out before us in your word. Stop it. God, get in our way and knock us down. When we try to live outside of the realm of your book, when we misrepresent you, sometimes even on purpose, God, Stop us from that. That we might not mar the image of Jesus, the image of biblical Jesus, to the onlooking eyes of the world. God, if it doesn't start with us, I don't know where it starts. So in your church, bring conviction. Bring conviction and repentance for the way we've disregarded your instructions. And then use us as ambassadors of the great love of your kingdom. That all might know there is a Savior whose name is Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, in Christ's name. Amen.